Hello, Internet. We are back. We're carrying on with the Seven Met series, so I'm quite excited. I have a fellow here called Mornay Cheatham. I really hope I say that name correctly. I'm not good at this. And uh, he served in Seven Met as an uh, ops medic, but a bit more than that, I would say. And uh, he's going to tell his story to us now today. First, let me say welcome, Mornay. I'm glad you're here, man. Very glad. Thank, Thank you. you for coming back to us again. I say again, he was first speaking to him out, but something went wrong with the interview. And then I said, no, man, I'll, I'll, I'll do it quickly. To the rest of you out there, there might be some noise. You know, we're building here with a hotel. We're still building the guest toilets for the restaurant here right below the studio. But I was just not in the mood to walk to the gym, which is on the other side of the building with my laptop to try and record there. So I'm sure that uh, we can live with that. If there's any noise, I apologize. Cannot be helped, guys. The um, restaurant must get done so we can start making money and start feeding people decent vegan food. I'm sure the South Africans now are grinning and pulling faces and all sorts of things. Rebecca, the other day, said uh, on air that Baltung is disgusting. Yeah, that's what happens when you marry a foreigner. But anyway, here we are again. Mornay, thank you. Can I ask you, where did this start for you? What happened? How did you end up in 7 Met? Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Chris, and uh, you got the names right. Um, probably a good point to start is just before the military. Um, so, um, you know, my background, uh, my mother's side of the family, Afrikaans, uh, were part of the original uh, fur trackers over the Drakensberg. My grandmother was, my great grandmother was a Vepner. She was uh, Lo Vepner's niece for anybody that knows the story of Lo Vepna uh, back in history. Um, but I'll start, I was at Pretoria Boys High um, and during my schooling, I um, was a St. John's first aider, so at sports events and what have you. I always had a keen interest in first aid uh, from there. As I entered into my matric year, my dad and I started discussing what I was going to do after school. And I was very keen to go and uh, study a BSc in computer science, wanting to be a systems analyst. I know, I don't know what I was thinking. And my dad said, you know what, you're too young. You don't know what you want to do. You go into your national service and I'll pay for whatever university for as ever long you want. But if you want to go to university now, you find your own way. Of course, I thought that was very mean of him. I didn't really like the idea. I didn't feel I had a choice. But because I had an interest in first aid, I applied to uh, SAMS, to the medical corps. Uh, interestingly enough, um, on finishing my national service, I uh, waited 12 years before I went to university studying an MBA in Australia. And then in 2017, going to Harvard and furthering my business studies um, from there. So I did eventually go and study, but not after school or even after the military. Um, I've been in Australia since 1999, but more about that later. So after applying to the medical corps, um, this was February 87, um, I was sent to Potchefstroom to the SAMS training college known as Pliptriff, or more affectionately, Siftriff, because it wasn't a nice place. Um, and um, I had a little bit of an attitude and uh, I was G1K1 in the medical classification, which meant I wasn't going to get out very quickly. And, you know, the military had a special way of sorting out rebels without a course. Um, and I remember the one day uh, we were having to run back and forward and, you know, hey, troop can haal my blood, die boom, die boom achter. And of course, off I went, uh, but with not too much effort, lackluster. And the corporal called me over and he said, come sit next to me. And he said, now, the rifleman Cheatham, he's too good for all of you. So he's going to come sit here and watch the rest of you. And of course, the rest of them ran back and forward and I sat down. What do you think happened to me when we got back to the tent? Exactly. I think is the word. And guess what? My attitude changed. I realized this was not going to be good for me. The military also had another thing, which was called water PT, which was a case of drink a liter of water, run 100 meters, drink a liter of water, run 100 meters. 
you did this three times max and you threw up like there was no tomorrow. This is how the military got you into line. Um, it makes me think of the story earlier this year in the United Kingdom where a soldier um, was insubordinate to a senior officer giving him instruction and I just shake my head. What has happened to the world and the fabric of a military? The fabric of a military works because of discipline and obeying and respecting your senior commanders. That discipline has taken me through business and at the age of 55, I'm very pleased to say that I'm all but retired. I do still do business consulting, but I don't need to. And that was thanks to what I learned in the military. So trying to get out of Clipgriff, I decided, well, I've got to go and do jails, junior leaders, but I didn't make it. The next option was to become an ops medic because I didn't want to be in a military base hospital as a normal medic, changing bedpans, changing sheets, wiping people clean. I just, that, that's not what I wanted to do. So I applied uh, along with uh, probably about 300 others for um, uh, the Ops Medics program. But before I do, I've got to tell you a little bit about Clipgriff. The chefs were ingenious. They didn't know how much coffee to make. They didn't know how much tea to make. So they made equal amounts and poured it together and called it kotiafia. Now, it was coffee, it was tea. It was a little bit of both. It tasted horrible, but it was warm and Potchestrum gets cold. So you would drink the stuff uh, from there. I remember a, a gentleman with us who we called Opa, Opa von Sale. He was about 40 years old and he had his whole life managed to evade conscription until it caught up with him. Well, he was a little bit of an alcoholic. Only problem is he's in basic training and there's no alcohol. He then discovered methylated spirits. Where did he discover this? Well, we all had it for polishing our shoes. And he cut off the corner of his sponge mattress, poured the methylated spirits through it and drank it. Of course, got violently ill, off to the sick bay, thought he would get discharged. That didn't work. Eventually, on guard duty at the gate of Clipgriff, he fired his weapon, his R1 which had a magazine with five rounds with a piece of wire through it. So you'd have to break the seal to release the, the round. It wasn't accidental. Well, that finally got him into DB and I later learned it did get him discharged. So he achieved that. Now at Clipgriff on a Wednesday was drill or sport. So as a schoolboy, I had done karate and I thought, well, I'll go and do karate because that's a way to get out of uh, drill school. And at the same time, there was another gentleman called Jose de Fonseca, and his name will come up a few times. And he was a Newcastle boy, and we've become lifelong friends. He was my best man at my wedding, and we went through our national service together all the way through uh, Ops Medics, through 7Med, through CSI, and I'll tell you more about that uh, later uh, from there. And we became friends through trying to beat each other up. It's a nice way to become friends. So... In about April of 1987, um, we were off to Fuertrack Uhrta, uh to the uh, SAMS uh, training facility where the Ops Medics course was undertaken. During this time, Jose and I met a gentleman called Gavin Ferguson, otherwise affectionately known as Fergie, uh, and the three of us became exceptional friends. Fergie also followed through to 7Med uh, from there. Uh, Gavin is now based in Perth as a mining engineer, and we still stay in touch, which is something special about those relationships developed. They are really lifelong. The military made you mix with people you wouldn't greet in the street, made you entrust your life in the hands of people you didn't even know, and vice versa, because it worked and it worked so well. So at Fort Tracker Huerta, the Ops Medics training comprised uh, uh, primarily around trauma, advanced first aid, anatomy, physiology, uh, pharmacology. Practical training was undertaken uh, at various hospitals. The three that I did my training at was, amongst others, um, Tembisa, Califong, and, of course, at Baraguanath Hospital. The reason the military were using these hospitals was the volume of trauma that came through casualty. 
They made us work 36 hour shifts to try and robotize your procedures that you just did stuff. You did not think about it. They taught us how to triage. How could you best utilize your time to save as many people in the shortest amount of time and not necessarily address the worst injured person? Because they were probably the ones who are going to take your most amount of time and die anyway. So you got to learn that. Um, during that time, you learned about the highs of being an ops medic or a paramedic in that your intervention saved lives. You also learned about the lows in that sometimes, didn't matter what you did, people died anyway. And you learned the hard lesson that CPR doesn't always work. I remember there was an instructor there that said to us, just think about it this way. If you're performing CPR, the person is already dead. You can't kill a dead person, but you could possibly revive them. And that was an interesting lesson. Um, during the time we got to work at um, Califong Hospital and worked in the mortuary, and the idea was to um, desensitize us from the aspect of death. That desensitizing has stuck with me for life, probably a part that um, not my family or friends enjoy. I do not sympathize well. I do not attend funerals because I will offend. Because in my eyes, when somebody's dead, they're dead. It's a carcass. Um, and, you know, that was probably the part of the military that toughened me up psychologically as well um, from there. But, you know, at the time I was working at uh, Tembisa and uh, I remember there was a head-on collision between two um, high-ass uh, minivans, Toyota high-asses, and they must have brought in 25, 30 people, which befuddles you how so many people were able to get into two vehicles. And that was part of that triage of just working like a machine, deciding who could you help where uh, as quick as possible and get through as many as possible. Um, on the same night, um, a man was brought in with half his skull uh, removed by a panga. Um, and of course, uh, we were there learning to suture with the aid of the doctors and the registrars, uh, because there was also with the medical students uh, that were there as well. Um, and of course, um, as we were suturing together and we were administering fluid therapy, he started coming too. And as he was coming too, I just remember him saying, Ish, doctor, kaka, kaka. And of course, he swelled himself. It was so foul, but you had to carry on. You couldn't stop. And when you stop, you had to clean it up. So you got to learn those parts of being a medic as well. Um, and as he was coming to, we were trying to ascertain, so what exactly happened to you? And he said, well, this man came into their township with a panga looking for woman. And he intervened and the guy hit him with a panga in the head. And we said, what did he look like? And he looked at me and went, he looks like you. And of course, I got teased and mocked by my fellow ops medics as trainees for a long time about I was this guy going through uh, um, townships looking for women. So yeah, that was probably one of the more humorous sides um, from there. Um, during that time as an ops medic, we were also uh, teamed off with uh, two SI uh, infantry that were also based in Fort Tracker Wuchter uh, and sent off in Biffles. Biffles were these um, Unimogs chassis that had been converted and armor plated as mini troop carriers. Very agile, very efficient. Uh, and each of them needed a medic when they went into the township duties uh, from there. So you got to see another side of uh, life as well. You got to work. This was your first experience of working with other branches of the South African Defence Force. Towards the end of um, the ops medic training, um, a Corporal Marius Whittle, uh, who was a physical uh, instructor from 7Med, uh, came to chat to the ops medics to encourage us to um, join 7Med, um, or at least uh, undergo selection to be able to join 7Med um, from there. And, uh, you know, as he spoke to us, he said, look, one of the things you'll be doing is you'll be going to Bloemfontein, you'll be 
uh, trained as a, a parachutist because part of what Seven Medical Battalion does is it provides specialized medical um, support to uh, the parish paratroopers and to special forces. And of course, that idea intrigued me, partly because in my uh, later years in high school, um, I was a civilian parachutist uh, with the club in Petersburg. So going from Pretoria to Petersburg over a weekend and jumping as a 17 year old. Um, at that time, I recall it was uh, round shoots with what was called a TU modification. Um, not unlike what we had at Bloom with uh, round shoots, um, which were from memory affectionately called Pampuna, because they looked like a pumpkin uh, from there, these big green, dark green pumpkins. Um, so Jose, Gavin, I, and a whole lot of others undertook selection. On successful completion um, of the Ops Medics course, we were then promoted to Lance Corporals, receiving our, our first stripes, and then moved into 7 Med and embarked on 7 Med's uh, regime, which included, um, I remember, what was called Marble PT. Now, Marble wasn't a nice round little piece of glass. It was a big square of concrete probably in size 30 by 30, maybe a slightly larger by probably about 15 centimeters. And it weighed around 25, 30 kilos. And you had to carry this with one hand in front of you of your groin and one behind your bum with this odd square and walk across uh, the parade ground uh, with this marble, which was excruciatingly painful. Um, and taxing because the thing would constantly slip out of your hands. But what uh, Marius Whitley was doing was preparing us for what we would encounter when we went down to Bloemfontein because this was exactly the same PT regime that would be done. We ran around Fuertracker Wuerte with poles and tyres and just running so much that to this day, if there's one thing I hate, is running. Uh, from there, you would learn to... Put a pebble under your tongue, focus on the guy in front of his heels and just go in a trance and just run and just forget until it was over. And suddenly two and a half hours was over and it was done um, from there. I've never been fitter in my life um, from when uh, I came out of Bloom. It was uh, to be Hulk, uh, to say the least. Um, so... Um, after, uh, after selection and doing the PD phase with uh, 7 Medical Battalion, um, we were further desensitized, sent back to Califong Hospital together with the Tiki students, working further in the morgues, doing further intensive uh, medical training, which included minor surgical procedures um, from there. Um, and uh, from there, we were then sent down to uh, one parachute battalion in Bloemfontein. As I mentioned earlier, selection was pretty gru grueling, uh, too much running, uh, uh, not my favourite pastime. I think I said that before. And after that, we moved into uh, hangar phase, um, which was just painful on the joins, you know, all that dropping and it was on concrete. I mean, I got such bad shin splints, I think I still have them today, thanks to uh, one para. Um, after uh, Bloemfontein, uh, Jose and I were sent down to one reconnaissance regiment. For those of you who don't know, one reconnaissance regiment is uh, on the bluff in Durban, um, overlooking the sea, probably the single best uh, NCO quarters I have ever experienced having a room that has a big window overlooking a cliff on the sea um, and why we were but I wasn't there long enough why we were sent there was uh, to do um, medical cover for operator selection uh, otherwise known as recce's um, which was done uh, in uh, Duku Duku uh, which is in the Umpholozi St Lucia from memory wetlands um, from there, probably one of the biggest uh, um, medical injuries is blisters because the guys would walk with wet socks, wet boots, and would literally develop a second skin 
around their foot. It blistered so much. I remember Duku Duku was particularly uh, revered for not only uh, the brutalness of the selection, but also for the danger in the bush. Uh, Duku Duku, for many of those don't know, uh, is also the home of uh, what's known as a gaboon viper, which is an adder with little horns on, and it bites backwards. So when the guys are walking patrols, they've got to be hyper vigilant and to try and fit in on one of their walks as the medic I joined, uh, only to have my rucksack pulled from behind as I nearly stood on one of these kaboon vipers. So that was my first lesson in trust the people around you because if you're not looking, somebody else is. I think in Afrikaans, the saying was, kijk voor jou die weermacht, kijk achter jou. Well, there was definitely somebody looking after my back end uh, from there. During the time at the Bluff, we were also um, uh, trained in foreign weapons and demolition. And you wanted to do these courses because all these courses from danger pay, jump allowance, dem allowance, you know, all combined were increasing your monthly pay. And for those who are not aware, at that time, it was around 164 rand is what you could max out as a national serviceman with all of that collectively. And then the bonus was, if something happened to you, your family would get 10,000 rand from the South African Defence Force. So that's what your life was worth. And now, 35 years later, if you look at those amounts, they're not a hell of a lot. And by the way, the 164 rand was per month, not per day. Um, I, I heard recently that um, there was a... Um, a company in the United Kingdom looking for former medics to go into Israel and Gaza as medical cover for journalists, paying them 400 pounds a day. And I'm thinking I was being paid 164 rand a month. So just something to uh, uh, digest from there. Right. So having finished uh, my training and also the cover down at One Reconnaissance Regiment, um, Jose and I were detached to CSI, um, Director of Special Tasks, in Sector 20 at uh, a base called Fort St. Michel. Um, not dissimilar to the name for the patron saint of the paratroopers. Only thing is this was spelled M-I-C-H-E-L, not L-L-E um, from there. Uh, St. Michel, if you were traveling from Katima Malila, which is where you flew into with the Air Force, and just as you hit the Golden Highway, it's just that little part of the Caprivi Strip that narrows down into a straight piece. If you turned right, this was to St. Michel. If you turned left, this was to Fort Dopis, which was Special Forces base uh, on the Caprivi Strip. At the juncture where St. Michel was, we were pretty much at the apex of the Caprivi Strip of Southwest Africa. Um, below us, Botswana, just to the right from memory was Zambia, and to the left was uh, Angola um, from there. The officer commanding uh, St. Michel on arrival was uh, Jan Breitenbach. Um, Colonel Jan was an exceptional man. He uh, had the mantra in his base, that everybody went by first name, except he was Colonel Young. Everybody else was first name because he felt everybody that was there was there by selection, by choice, by invitation. They were not forced to be there and could leave any time from there. So it was a whole very different mantra and a very much a privilege for me to have worked with these individuals. Um, during my time at St. Michel, Colonel Young retired uh, then Commandant Bert Saxer took over from Colonel Young um, and eventually became a colonel himself. Both gentlemen were leaders in their field. Colonel Young, having come from 3-2 Battalion, invited a lot of former 3-2 Battalion members, which I'll uh, talk a little bit more about. And uh, Bert Saxer uh, was a former Rhodesian Salute Scout. So these are guys that knew guerrilla warfare. They knew uh, the enemy. They knew the tactics. Uh, they were strategic. But foremost, foremost at both minds was the safety of their people. They never, ever, I know it's weird to say in a military uh, environment, 
placed their individuals in any position that they couldn't handle themselves uh, from there. And it's another thing that took me through my business career. Um, they did push you beyond the point that you thought you could go, um, definitely. On the base, we um, had two base ops medics, two seven med space ops medics, which were Joe's and myself. Colonel Young's wife was a nurse. Uh, we still taught her how to suture before Colonel Young retired. Um, from there, she had never had the opportunity to suture uh, from there. And I remember Jose still, you know, uh, literally cutting the skin on his forearm to allow her to suture uh, his, his forearm together. Not a big cut, but uh, nonetheless, uh, giving her that skill and ability. Later on, uh, we had a doctor join us uh, who was uh, Dr. Etienne Prinsler. I still keep in touch with him. Um, now, Colonel Yan, um, having come from 3-2, didn't actually stay on the base in St. Michelle. He stayed outside the base on the Huando River. And his house, which uh, looking at Google Maps, and I'll share those pictures, is still there today. Uh, it's now a wildlife reserve house. Um, and it was appropriately called Buffalo. Uh, on the Kwando River uh, from there. Um, so, as I mentioned, St. Michel with Chief Staff Intelligence um, under DST, uh, established by Colonel Yan, was a guerrilla training camp for uh, foreign uh, insurgents friendly with uh, the South African Defence Force, so friends of South Africa. Um, we had two outer bases going towards Angola. The first was Kasinga, where we trained UNITA troops. And then the second was just across the border uh, into Angola, known as Ingwe. Um, I'll talk more about um, the, the, the training at Kasinga. And one of the things that Joe's and I had to do was to teach basic um, first aid to the troops, um, the UNITA troops. And where possible, single out individuals that showed promise. Um, now, one of the individuals that showed promise was a, a troop by the name of Chipo. And I decided to teach him to suture. And uh, Jose, speaking Portuguese, would translate. And I explained to him, you know, split skin, suture closed. And it was basic suture, just to close it up. And he got it. And off we went. And several weeks later, went back to Kasinga. Uh, and uh, Kasinga, again, the name, um, nothing to do with the Battle of Kasinga. It was named well before the Battle of Kasinga. Um, but, of course, named because of the area. And we went back to the base. And there were all these guys walking around on tippy toes. I went, what the heck's going on here? And uh, I called Chipa over and Jose, and Jose translated. I said, what's happening? He said, you teach me. Skin split, I stitch closed. He was stitching guys' blisters closed. Oh, my God. Can you imagine suture material on your heel rubbing because the medic had stitched it closed? Well, we had to retranslate that only if it's bleeding profusely do you stitch closed, but don't stitch blisters closed. <laughs> Use methylate. That was a, a, a better option. Would burn like hell, but they'd be off. They'd be okay after that. So um, at St. Michel, uh, uh, many of the officers and uh, the permanent force non-commissioned officers, as I mentioned, were uh, with Colonel Yan at 3-2 Battalion. Um, I remember the captains on the base were Captain Steph Nordier um, and uh, Peter Williams. Peter Williams also came from 3-2 Battalion. We also had a Sergeant Kuni Rickett, who came from 3-2 Battalion's reconnaissance unit uh, out of uh, uh, Omani uh, from memory. Um, we had another um, operator, Sergeant Mike Lapis Labaskahni. Uh, and Mike uh, was one of the um, Space Force operators um, from there. And he had come to us sometime afterwards from, he had been involved in the Battle of 
in in Dunga, if I remember, it was something along those right lines. Probably saying it incorrectly, but if my memory serves me correct. Uh, now he was the epitome of if you thought of Rambo in a movie. Arnold Schwarzenegger, big muscles, brawny guy. Well, this is what uh, Mike Loveskakny looked like. Um, he really was the movie character of a special forces guy. Um, he had a specific technique, I remember this, of walking. Um, and we did one operation with him, which I'll come to. Um, and his walking technique, and he had his shoes, that he, his waxies were smooth. There was no print on them. And he would walk on the sides of his feet, not flat-footed, but on the sides. And what he and he would never take the same steps twice. So it was impossible for anybody to track him. And he wouldn't make a sound. He would go into an enemy base, infiltrate, map it out, walk it out, and come back, and they didn't even know he was there. This is how good he was. And this is how good the guys were that you know we had the privilege of, of working with. Um, one of the majors on the base um, also came from uh, the 3-2 recce unit out of Umami, and that was Major Willem Rutter. I remember Major Willem, thin little guy, glasses um, from there, and he was always serious. He was, he was never uh, not serious, but not serious in a, in a, in a boring way. Serious in he took everything uh, to heart. He was meticulous in what he did. We were doing demolition training for the UNITA troops and he had a um, PE4 plastic explosive detonator in his hand and he held it and he went, just the temperature and the pressure. And as he did it the second time, it blew. Blew into his hand, blew into his fingers. So Jose, myself, uh, the doctor had to attend to this. And, of course, at that time, we would use um, a general anaesthetic known as ketolol or ketamine uh, from there. Relatively safe. You would look at somebody's uh, uh, body mass, and I'd say he's about 80 kilograms, and then based on that, you would uh, administer a certain amount of grams per kilogram per half hour to keep him under, and then guess how long this is going to take. Uh, the only side effect of ketolol is that it uh, causes nightmares. Um, so Jose had to sit on a major villain's arm whilst we worked on his hand because he was violently convulsing. And when he came to, we said, major villain, are you okay? He said, no, no. I said, you know, you were convulsing quite a lot. You know, it looked like you were having a nightmare. He said, I was. I said, what were you dreaming about? He said, I was dreaming there were eight, there were elephants with AK-47s chasing me and I was trying to dodge them. So we thought that was quite funny and we laughed about that several times afterwards. But being the serious individual he was and the professional, he went straight back to continue the training. There was no, I'm on a plane, back to civvies, back down south. He went straight back. I mean, you know, total respect to the man. And I tell you what, those troops would never manhandle a debt ever because that was live example of what happens. So I think they learned their lesson um, from there. So at the base, as I mentioned, we had Colonel Young, Commandant uh, uh, Bert Saxer, who took over from Colonel Young. We had another Commandant uh, Gower, and we also had a, a Commandant Willie Schneider, he was also from uh, three, previously from 3 to Battalion, uh, from the Reiki unit. He was a commander there. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about him because I did uh, a few officers with him. We had, and we called him Sergeant Dallas, and for the life of me, I can't remember his first name, um, who was the Tiffy. Now, Sergeant Dallas could fix anything. This was the guy who could make a diesel engine run on petrol and vice versa. I know that's impossible, but this is literally the skill of this individual. On an ops, he had this big Quefil, um, which is an armor-plated uh, Sarmal uh, 100, um, V deflection, single cab, and then it's got a big, uh, like, a, like a tow truck arm on the back. 
where he had extra axles. So as we were going on opses, if a Casper hit um, uh, a landmine, you know, he'd back up, hoist it up, pull the axle off, which was the design of the Casper. Um, and I should mention, I had the privilege at San Michel once of meeting General Pansagro, who I'm told uh, was the brains behind the design of the V. If you think a lot of other militaries at the time had a flat base. So if there was a blast, everybody inside was badly injured or killed. Whereas the Casper, the Wolf, the Querful all had this V. So if there was a blast, it would blast away and deflect. And the people inside, other than being shell-shocked, would actually survive. Um, anyway, Dallas had this ability of hoisting it up, pulling the old axle off, putting a new one on, matter of hours, and we were back at it again. This was the guy. So, as again, as you can hear as I'm telling the stories, um, the individuals were professionals in what they did, and they did it not well. They did it exceptionally well and even better than that um, from there. And, you know, I'm going to say this a few times. My time as a national serviceman was only two years. It was only a two-year window in that war. But what I saw and experienced in two years gave me the greatest respect for the individuals that were there. The operators that I was with, I would not want to be with anybody else. Today in civilian life, people ridicule people like this, think there's something wrong with them. Well, I tell you what, they were professionals. If I was in a bar fight, I want them definitely in my side. If I was at somebody's wedding, you know, trying to behave, probably not the right guys because they couldn't sit still long enough um, from there. Now, I do remember uh, between Fort Dorpies and St. Michel, just off the Golden Highway, we also had a runway. Uh, I've looked on Google Maps. It's still there. At the time, it was called Amelman. I have no idea what it's called today. And this is where we would do joint uh, jump training with um, with Fort Dorpies. This is where we would have Dakotas flying in, King Airs. The runway was long enough um, from there um, as uh, part of uh, training exercises from there. Um, actually, talking about Fort Dorpies, one of the training exercises that we did and Joe's and I were involved in was together with Sam Michel and with... Um, uh, for Dorpies was training the pathfinders. We had some 20, 22 pathfinders come through, um, had combined jump days with them at Umulman Runway, but was also to do uh, advanced medical aid trauma training with uh, the pathfinders. And uh, I actually had the privilege of going with some more experienced permanent force pathfinders on an ops with Willie Schneider, but I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, further uh, on. So on an ops, uh, you know, uh, part of the task of the medic, or in my case and in my time, was at San Michel, I uh, did the base signals uh, from there. So I would fill in for the signaler, who was nicknamed Speckies because he was quite a chubby little guy. Um, and uh, I was also the 5-0 gunner. Uh, on ops with uh, Veli Vamba, uh, Colonel Schneider, or Commandant Schneider at the time, sorry. Um, we also did the medical training. We also did uh, chemical, uh, chemical biological warfare medical training for the troops, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the, the opses that we did were surveillance ops, uh, and you know, part of my time uh, in my service was also keeping insurgents alive during inter interrogation as part of uh, uh, coin ops or counterinsurgency operations. So at the base, um, the chefs were always very friendly with the medics, best friends, because what did they want? They wanted cough mixture. Um, and they wanted as much of it as they could lay their hands on. They would fake coughs. They would fake colds just to get it um, from there. And of course, the medics would, within reason, um, uh, oblige because they would reciprocate by getting the medics creatine and mass builder and, you know, great cuts of steak. Um, and of course, some bar credits, which also helped. But the challenge was that they wanted more. And, you know, even with special forces, even with CSI, uh, scheduled drugs are heavily 
controlled log. You had to log everything that was in your medical bag, where it went to, who it went to, what did you do with the excess. Um, there was no way. Whilst I could at uh, Saint Michel order whatever I liked, I had to account for it. You know, I've heard stories subsequently of, you know, medics dispensing and you know drug habits and selling. Uh, I never came across that. I never saw it. If it was, it wasn't in any of the bases I've worked at um, from there. I do, however, remember a certain uh, gentleman on our base who had a Rottweiler, a ghastly thing. Now, on the base, we would breed cats. And the purpose of breeding the cats was to keep snakes and bugs and creatures out of the causes, out of the living areas. Um, and this certain Rottweiler... Um, had a pension for chasing cats, biting them, breaking their backs, and leaving them um, from there. I also remember a situation, you know, whilst uh, finishing my time up at St. Michel, uh, a new uh, infantry lieutenant had come up from Luatla, fresh out of uh, infantry training and officers' training with a chip on his shoulder, no pun intended, and on Sundays in the base, it was known that we would um, have siesta and go and sit on the Kwanda River and fish. Not that you would catch anything, but it was just a relaxed session. Anyway, this new lieutenant came down on a Unimog, screaming and shouting, you Tampax medics, come here. And I looked at this and I went, mm, I don't know about that. So I got up, put the rod down, walked over and I said, excuse me? What did you say? And he said, Yate make a worry, you fucking sick Tampax medic. And as he said that, and he was down on the ground, lights out. So medics also sometimes had to defend themselves because they were called not nice things. Well, that got me into a lot of trouble because it was immediately, well, first Jose and I had to check that he was okay because he was lights out, not that I'd hurt him badly. Um, put him on his Unimog, back to the base, RSM, it was RSM Buenzai, wanted to know what went on. I explained what I did, uh, you know, heavily pleaded my case of, you know, uh, he was being disrespectful. And the RSM said, look, you can't get away with this. Regardless, you've struck an officer, uh, but we'll deal with this internally. You will be stripped of your rank and your pay for two weeks. And I will deal with uh, Colonel Burt in regarding one of his junior officers. Um, and it went away, albeit that I was without pay. And at that time, you know, having, uh, you know, half of your 164 rand disappear was a lot of money. That was beer money anyway. Um, so there were those sides. Now, Jose, who I mentioned several times, loved snakes. This guy was a freakazoid with reptiles. We'd walk patrols and he'd be in the bush and he's pulling, you know, a worm slung out of the tree. And it's like, dude, I, I nearly shot my foot. What the hell are you doing? Well, on the one trip back from Katima Malila, just as we got onto the Golden Highway and we were going back to San Michel, stop, stop, stop. And a Unimog is left-hand drive. He got out on the road, was this three-meter python lying there, dead straight, like it was dead. And he picked it up by the head, by the tail, and he got in. As he got in, I got out. It was like, uh-uh, I don't like that. So he had to, we, when we drove back, he had to ha have it hanging out of the window as we drove back to the base to the sick bay. Went to the sick bay, he was cutting open saline drips, pouring it into a, like a little tub, and he put the snake in this tub. And of course, its genitalia were exposed. So he said, Look, it's sick, I've got to help it, and what have you. And I'm going to speak to the chefs, we're going to get some comp plan, some mass builder. Um, some creatine and we're going to mix it with steak and we're going to feed it to the snake. And I said, I'm not taking part of this. He said, and, you know, we need some blood. Jose, I'm not doing this. So being the medic he was, tourniquet himself, put the trocar in, drew his own blood, mixed it with the comp plan, the meat, fed the snake. And as he was feeding the snake, pythons have this ability to, to disengage their jaws and it dislodged the jaw and it slid, and as it slid, it bit all the way and it scraped. So he was lacerated all the way down. I had to give him a tetanus injection, bandage him up, and of course, Colonel Burt then wanted to know what was going on. 
had to tell Colonel Burt. Colonel Burt wasn't very impressed that there was a snake in the sick bay. Um, anyway, that was another story uh, that I do recall and it was kind of uh, humorous at the time uh, from there. So one of the longest ops that I did, COVID ops, was with uh, uh, Willem Snyders, otherwise known as Billy Vumbo, um, which lasted about eight weeks with a group of operators, with uh, Mike Lovescuchny as a uh, group of Pathfinders, sorry, with Mike Lovescuchny as the operator. So we were two Caspers, uh, Quairful, uh, Tiffy truck for hoisting up if anything happened um, from there. And off we went, um, north of Oshakati. Um, and, you know, as, as, as we did that ops, one of the components was, which we later found out, was um, to provide protection cover for the then um, president of South Africa, who was P.W. Buerta, and the head of the Defence Force, uh, General Magnus Milan, as they were meeting with uh, Jonas Savimbi, who was then the leader of UNITA. Um, so that was a, an, an interesting, unexpected uh, meeting. And, you know, this is pre-social media, pre-glamour uh, on TV. So this was literally meeting, you know, celebrities. This was meeting, you know, the chief of the Defence Force. This was meeting the head of UNITA. This was meeting um, uh, P.W. Buerta and... Uh, a seven med medic after me um, said that somewhere he saw at um, uh, Langebaan uh, Reconnaissance Regiment a photograph of me in it. I've tried to source that photograph, but uh, have been unsuccessful um, from there. And I do remember at that time um, uh, P.W. Buerta saying, uh, and it became famous for the quote of saying, I think it was something along the lines of, the enemy of my enemy is something like my friend or something like that. Um, and this was just prior to the battle uh, of Quito Cunavale uh, from there. So for the historians might be able to piece when exactly that happened. Um, and this would have been early 1988, uh, to give an idea. So during my time as a, as a serviceman, you know, I had the privilege of delivering three babies, local population, one by episiotomy. The head was just too big. She was tearing and had to uh, cut. For those who don't know what's an episiotomy, is you cut sideways so that the tear doesn't go from the vagina to the anus, cause an infection uh, from there. Um, I also had the, the grim task of packing soldiers of misfortune, is what I prefer to call it, into body bags um, and having them their remains sent uh, down south. Um, but I should also say, life at St. Michelle was like living in a game reserve. Man, the wildlife around us was phenomenal. Fishing on a Sunday, walking patrols into a herd of elephant, 200, 250 elephants strong. I don't know how many. I do remember climbing up a tree that I got such a fright and waited for the herd to move on. These are big creatures um, from there. Uh, so much so that I, I almost signed on permanent force. I really enjoyed that time uh, with St. Michelle. So in about October of 88, um, I was recalled back to 7 Met, Jose and I, um, to undertake a chemical biological instructor's training. Um, this was conducted at uh, SWAT Corps uh, in Pretoria, which is where... South African Special Forces headquarters are, otherwise known as SPESCOP. Um, the training was done with a Major Brian Davey, who was the medical officer for um, in charge for 7th Medical Battalion, uh, specifically the Chemical Biological Warfare Program, which he had kind of inherited because when I started, uh, Brigadier Voda Basson was the officer commanding of 7th Med, and when I came back from CSI, Commandant Erasmus was the new OC um, from there. All the doctors. Uh, so we did the training and then Joe's and I were deployed back into the operational area, into Sector 1-0, um, to the medical command under a, um, got to remember this now, Commandant uh, Potkita, um, who was uh, the medical commander for Sector 1-0, 
Um, he then deployed us uh, in, in Oshikati and uh, the bases around Oshikati. From memory, these were bases like Otapi, uh, Okalunga, uh, Okatopi. Um, they all had these Oka names to them. It's kind of funny, um, uh, except for Otapi. And that was to train the local troops on uh, determining uh, if there was uh, uh, chemical biological agents. Uh, there was this device, I forget the name of it, uh, I'll share the photos, that in your suit was used as a little snipper and it could determine was it mustard gas, what was it. So we would train the troops on uh, gas mask techniques uh, from there. It was always preempted with this shout of gas, 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 and then you put your mask on um, and then cover yourself up. And then you had a decontaminant, uh, which is kind of like a talcum powder, only it was more uh, browny in color and it was known as Fuller's Earth. And any exposed areas, the idea of this was to decontaminate these areas um, from whatever uh, chemical agent had been uh, deployed against our troops um, from there. Once we finished that, we were sent back uh, to 7 Med, which was based at the, um, the aviation medicine uh, HQ, which had a centrifuge, and this was in Littleton, uh, Irene area um, from there. I think it is still there today, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, we were then um, detached to uh, the South African Air Force's Tactical Operations Unit for medical cover. They were going down to Sudwana uh, to do uh, medical cover, um, at, at, or tactical flying, sorry. And um, Jose and I were to collect a uh, Unimog ambulance and drive in convoy with the South African Air Force down to Sudwana, the longest drive of my life, because the convoy averaged 30, 40 kilometres an hour. Fortunate thing about a Unimog to the left, being left-hand drive, there's like a dial with little runs, and it was like a cruise control, if you would, an idle control more intended for cold weather, but we'd dial it and try and gauge the, the speed and then just sit back until we got to Sudwana. Most of what we did at Sudwana was ingrown toenails, stomach aches, headaches, what have you. Unbeknown to us, Sam's HQ had also sent a medical detail to provide cover, uh, comprising nurses and medics from One Mill Hospital. Uh, so towards the end, Jose and I discussed this and said, you know what? We just don't want to drive in that convoy back. Let's just get out of here. So in the stealth of night, we went to the Bowser, filled up the Unimog ambulance, got two 40-gallon drums, put them on the stretcher beds, and off we went back to Pretoria, stopping at two bases along the way to refuel. Um, having a purple beret does afford you cert with, with the, um, the, the, uh, the Rose Compass, does afford you some privileges, and nobody asked too many questions. We refueled, signed logs, got to Pretoria. When we got back to 7 Med, um, our RSM, Jimmy May, was wait, waiting for us. And Jimmy, you speak to anybody, was the fabric that held 7 Med together. Uh, ex Rhodesian uh, scout, uh, gentleman of note, protected his guys to the nth degree. And very English, except he knew one word, and that word was cock. Uh, for those who don't speak Afrikaans, shit. And he said, you guys are in a heap, sorry, not you guys, you oaks are in a heap of cock. Uh, but I've covered you. I've told uh, Seth that uh, I signaled to recall you urgently because I needed you back in the bluff um, and that they had medical cover, they were okay, um, and that somehow the, the, the signals went astray. Uh, that was the good man that he was. But he wasn't lying. He sent us back to the bluff uh, to get us out of harm's way. Um, and the second trip back to the bluff wasn't to provide medical cover for operator selection because that's not done 24-7 uh, throughout the year. So ours was to relieve two seven med medics that were based at one reconnaissance. Um, 
And uh, this time around, we got to enjoy the private rooms that we had overlooking uh, the ocean. Um, we also were used for uh, like a community outreach clinic program, which was afforded to permanent force members not living on the base to them and their families. So we would frequently go out. Part of it was social work as well uh, for um, the base nurses not wanting to go on their own when there were issues of domestic violence and things like that, which also is in the fabric of any military, unfortunately. Um, uh, so after that, we went back to 7 Med, and around the 18th of December, 18th, 19th, we regathered uh, for the first time, many of us saw each other again. Now, unlike Jose and myself that spent such a long time at one detachment with CSI, most of the 7 Med space medics were in and out of various uh, reconnaissance regiments, in and out with various opses, be they ops modular, um, uh, be they others um, from there. Um, some weren't uh, named in their COVID nature. Um, and uh, at that time when we got there, um, Vote of Asson was no longer the OC. It was now uh, Commandant uh, Erasmus. Uh, who then pinned our Pro Patria medals onto our chests. Um, and we have a picture with Jimmy, which I'll share. And we cleared out. Um, Jose and I did a camp together two years later at Seven Med. Um, the whole regime had changed. Um, Bode Basson uh, was no longer there. Erasmus was no longer there. There was a new OC, new RSM, new people. Um, from there. Um, and I reflect on that time, of course, as, you know, again, I said it and I'll say it again, mine was a two-year window. Um, and the people and the individuals I got to meet gave me the greatest respect for the discipline and the talent and the training that the South African Defence Force gave to its recruits. Um, you know, I then uh, reflect from there. Um, I did not want to go to university. I wanted to get into business. I joined uh, Siemens at the time in Bramfontein, um, through whom I was privileged enough to travel the world, working in Germany, working in the US. Um, and then more recently, in 1999, they sent me to Australia on a two-year assignment. Well, 24 years later, uh, here I am, and at the age of 55, I'm semi-retired. I still undertake management consults from time to time and still consider what's that one next big thing before I eventually do pick up sticks and finally retire um, from there. So I'm pretty sure my story is not uh, like every other story that you've had on uh, Legacy, but it is mine and it is my experience and I cherish the, the memories. I cherish the skills I learned. I don't mean to dis demean uh, or denigrate any storm and driver uh, administration officer, but I feel they missed on the privileges I had. I came out of the military basically qualified as a paramedic. I went in as a boy. I came out as a man. I went in having no idea what I wanted to do. I came out with a purpose. I remember as a young manager with Siemens um, at 24 recruiting, and I have somebody sitting in front of me that hadn't done national service and asking them, so where do you want to be in five years? And they would look at me and go, I don't even know what I'm doing this weekend. Whereas for me, I came out of the military. I wanted a career. I wanted an income. I wanted a house. I wanted a car. I wanted it all. Um, the military taught me discipline, made me grow up, discipline that I carried through my career. It taught me to respect the position. I've worked with managers that personally I would never socialize with, but they were my superiors and I respected the position they held. And I'd like to believe that helped me accelerate my career and facilitate how well I did, a lot of it being luck, 
a lot of it being that discipline to be able to retire at a reasonably young age um, from there. So, yep, that's pretty much my story of my time in 1987 and 88 in the South African Defence Force with 7 Medical Battalion. Well, no, thank you. I really, really enjoyed this one, you know, and, and I have a few questions here, if you don't mind. Um, Please. Let me ask you first, your dad, did he, did he serve in any military? I mean, he was quite sure when he said to you, man, go to the army, you'll come out, you'll know what you want to do. So so, so he did. He was um, a, a bishop's boy. He grew up in the Cape. Um, for those of you who don't know, my grandfather was Jack Cheatham, who was a Springbok kick captain in the 50s um, from there. And, of course, uh, so he played provincial sport. He was an advanced PTI, otherwise known as a physical training instructor. And he was not in a combat region. And it was like, you don't know. I've been there. And, you know, when your dad tells you that and you're 18 years old, you go, you, what are you talking about? You know, until you're a father yourself and you know exactly what they were talking about. No, absolutely. I recall my dad saying the same to me. He said to me, man, yeah, you can go and study law, but, you know, why don't you rather go and have some adventure? Why do you want to be boring? Um, but I have to say, there were no real money for me to go to university. So we went later. But I'm impressed with this uh, shirt you, you're wearing, this black shirt. Can you tell us a little bit about it, please? Certainly. So some of the, um, the guys at 7Med, and there's quite a strong fellowship, 7Med. Uh, they have a WhatsApp group. Um, there would be close on 200 former members and current serving uh, members um, on that. Um, actually, most recently, the, the current RSM, um, being uh, Rian Marais, has just been promoted to be the chief RSM of the medical corps uh, from there. Um, and that literally happened this week. So, you know, well done, uh, Rian. And that just shows you, so through that fellowship, they formed a working committee to do some memorabilia of caps, shirts. Uh, from there, they did um, coins, pins um, from there and the members, you know, and it was literally sold at cost plus a little bit to keep, you know, uh, a fund available for um, um, doing initiatives for past members, fallen members, funerals, the likes of. The group was established initially for uh, 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 Fandre from Fearon, who passed away, and a few members got together and said, you know what, we want to help his daughters get through school. Let's establish a group and let's donate to a fund to help get his daughters through school in memory of him as a former 7 med member. Um, so they are involved uh, in uh, various initiatives. There is one X7 med member who's still in captivity uh, from there. So these are the things that they do <coughs> as a fellowship and keeping it alive and keeping memories and membership alive, um, forming a, uh, so at 7 Medical Battalion, there is also a uh, obelisk with the names of uh, many of whom have been awarded honoris crooks um, from there, doctors and medics, um, and once a year actually having a ceremony and remembering these individuals and sharing it with the group uh, from there. You know, we just recently had uh, Armistice Day on the 11th of November, uh, on the 11th hour, uh, remembering those. And even in Australia, from multiple wings of the South African Defence Force, we get together and we remember them. We also march in the Anzac Day Parade, which is on the 27th of April, um, from there. Where, and it's not about telling war stories. It's not about any of that. It's about remembering the people who are no longer there. Uh, from there, for many years, I resisted going. Uh, um, Aubrey Sonnenberg, you know, encouraged, encouraged, encouraged. And I said, I don't want to do this for me. And he said, it's not for you. It's for those who can't do it for themselves. And I went, that is a good reason. 
and I joined them. Um, and this year, uh, in memory of uh, the Battle of Kasinga, all the paratroopers uh, marched in the front of the platoon uh, from there, um, which was, you know, quite a great uh, memory to have. It was quite heartwarming um, from there. Actually, Aubrey Sonnenberg and Dave Curry, the former RSM of one medical battalion, in 2015 flew over to Perth. Because Colonel Jan Breitenbach was there and they presented him with a sword, and I'll share the photos, um, commemorative sword uh, for his service. And he was so thankful because his own sword had been stolen from his home where he lived in uh, he's in Neisner. Uh, yeah, I think it's in Otaniqua or somewhere that he stays and he's involved in nature conservation um, from there. So long answer to your how the shirts come about, but it would be wrong just to say there was a working group. I needed to explain why and how all of that comes about um, and why members are proud to wear their shirts. Which brings me to, to, to my next point. I mean, there's a lot of wankers out there who say they were in a unit and they were not. And I found that a lot of people, because the so the ops medic the paid so well, uh, there was a search for them going on in, a, in the 2000s, beginning with, with Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. And a lot of them were actually started lying on their CVs, uh, sadly so, sadly so. How do you people feel about a man who tried to steal your honour? You know, um, so uh, seven MED members are also members of SASFA, the South African Special Forces Association. And SASFA has a wall of shame. And we frequently uh, come across individuals. And because the network is so vast with so many members, inquiries are made. Has anybody heard of da-da-da-da? Who claims he was yada yada yada? Um, recently, there was one who thought he was so protected in luderitz that nobody would know, telling stories of he was with Seven Med, he was with Five Reconnaissance, he was yada, yada, yada. Well, he got, he got outed and he gets placed on a website, Wall of Shame. So how do I feel about that? I think it's pretty poor um, that people do that. Um, because it dishonors the memory of people that did the right thing and especially those that lost their lives doing it. Um, to then have a little badge stuck on you saying, hey, you know, I was part of that too. I don't like that. That, that, that really eats away at me. And I'll, and I'll out them. I'll, I'll out them publicly. Um, and if you look at SASFA's wall of shame, you know, there's guys in South Africa that have claimed their special forces allegiance because they run a security company. You know, there's a guy in Canada that tried the same thing, a guy in Germany that tried the same thing. And unfortunately, I think probably, of course, the biggest problem is, I don't know why, but people sell their memorabilia. And these individuals, it's not people that lost their stuff and are trying to regain it. These individuals gather this as their own and then make up a story to match it. Um, you know, the local branch of uh, South African military veterans um, had a raffle, um, and I'll share the picture of it, of a big frame of all the medals uh, that you could earn in the Angolan Bush War, all right? Um, I won that, uh, that, and it's hanging up on my wall. Three of the medals in there, I've got anyway, but that doesn't matter. Does that mean I'm going to open it up and put them on my chest? No, because for starters, how could I have the Konani um, Pro Patria medal? It's not possible. I couldn't. I don't do fake. Uh, and, and that includes people that claim stuff. Uh, I don't have much time for it. I don't have much tolerance. Well, I think it's needed. I think people should wake up. I mean, everybody served. There's no reason for you to start lying. You were there. If you were there, you know what? Just accept what you were. Everybody played a role, which brings there, me there's to... A, there's, there's, enough people, there's enough people that will out people, you know? If I say I was at San Michelle and I mentioned all these people and you go to Peter Williams, he goes, I've never heard of him before. You go to Willem Rutter, he says, that story about the hand, it doesn't exist. 
and, and so it would carry on. I'd get found out in a second. Yeah, exactly. Because as you mentioned the names here, we recorded it. You know, we've mm-hmm. recorded Steph Nadia, we've recorded Peter Williams, not all of these things. We're still chasing him, Willem Rotte, we're still chasing. But we it, it's interesting to me, the same names keeps coming up. Same mm-hmm. names. But this this organization you're talking about, where you drill in, in Australia, the veterans organization, is this open to anybody who's in Australia perhaps today is listening to you? Oh, so, in- so, so Chris, um, uh, uh, Sam Voa have a Facebook page closed. So it's just for members. It's not public. Um, so there's the Australian chapter. And the Australian chapter really is open to the whole of Australia as well as uh, the Asia-Pacific, so whether it be people in Indonesia, in Thailand, in Malaysia, in Singapore, in New Zealand, they will just, if there's enough of them, they will have a gathering of guys in Singapore, a gathering of guys in Perth. So from my knowledge, uh, the biggest groups, and I will share the, the web links with you, the biggest chapters are the Sydney group, um, the Perth group are very, very proactive, actually probably more so than the Sydney group. I know the Sydney group will argue with me and the New Zealand group. Um, and they, they will do stuff to raise funds, to support initiatives. Most recently, they were doing those old brown bush hats, Borsuka, okay, and selling them to raise funds. They did a, a golf shirt with the Samboa emblem on it. Uh, but they do these initiatives and then the funds of those go to, you know, doing memorial plaques for a, for a, a, a former member or like they did the sword for uh, Colonel Young. You know, that comes from them gathering those funds. And they are incredibly supportive of each other um, from there that actually if somebody was a storyteller, um, he wouldn't last very long. Did you ever feel pressurized? I mean, look, you speak Afrikaans as well as a native. You speak Afrikaans English equally well. But to a surname like Cheatham, and I was wondering about the cricketer about it as well. I mean, he was a fantastic cricket player. Um, ever felt pressurized because the army was sort of Afrikaans, you know, we spoke English for the first 50 years and nobody believed Clark, you. That was clearly a problem for my name. Ek dink vir baie mense, so dit daak een probleem kan wees. Ek dink ook die Weermacht, aangezien ek in een korthuis was, was ook die so streng vir my, want ek, ek het klaar my eie bed gemaakt. Ek moest so net een bykie meer stuik, en jy weet, een skoen po- borsel vat, en die streepies hierdie kant toe vryf, en die streepies daai kant toe vryf. Anyway, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, no, I, I never did. I think because my first name, Morne, and then of course my surname, Cheetah, I think confused many. You know, it's like, what the hell's going on here? And I very quickly say to them, my mass Afrikaans, my past English, you know, and that just kind of like... Yeah, that makes a lot, of, a lot of sense to me. I mean, you're actually lucky in a sense because, would you believe, I actually saw people during basics who couldn't make a bed. They couldn't iron. And I wanted to myself, you know, and, and they were overweight. And I thought to myself, what are some of the three things you want to die in basics if you, if you try that thing? But 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 now I want to ask you. You guys were trained at Kalafong and Baraguana, which is huge hospitals. Uh, I suppose you were in emergencies or, or, or emergency sort. It, it was restricted to the casualty um, from there, yeah. so it wasn't the general ward or ICU or anything like that. It was really restricted to casualty trauma because um, there was a time when, uh, specifically around that 86, 87, 88, that. Uh, South Africa almost had a shortage of ops medics um, as conflict was increasing, as opses were increasing. Um, so they needed to train them as quick as possible in trauma. Um, so it moved away from what was more textbook training to more on-the-job training. You learned, you know, I knew how to suture before I read any diagram on how to suture. Okay, but the question is, would you be in uniform? while you were working there. Would they know your army? Uh, you were in browns. You did have a white coat on, and hence the one guy calling me doctor. But you were definitely in browns just with uh, a white coat. Okay, but now these paratroopers, 
live interview at the Great Many of it. They say there's something very special about those paratrooper wings, according to a female's heart. So my question to you guys is, did the young nurses be interested in a young man from Seven Met? I think ladies, girls always like a man in uniform, regardless of uh, the color and the stars. So I don't think that made that much difference. I think it made more difference to the guy who had them telling the story that he had wings or he had pips or he had whatever. But for the girl, it, it didn't mean anything. She just saw a uniform and she either liked it or she didn't like it. And most liked it. I mean, who doesn't like a soldier? No, that's true. I have to, I have to admit that. No, I'm glad that you're selling me that. Good, good answer, Mornay. Good answer. Yeah. But I want to take you to St. Saint Michel, the, the base. I understand you people had some damn odd animals were walking around there from young elephant to, to all sorts of things. Uh, can you tell me about that, please? Because everybody knows about the lions at Fort Topis were kind of fear across the river. So you guys said... So it's interesting you say that because, you know, I heard about the lion at Fort Topis and I, I on occasion we socialised together at Fort Topis. We did the training of the pathfinders. I never saw this lion, but I heard a lot about it. I saw the photos in their bar. Uh, and I've got some photos that I got that I'll share. Um, I never saw it. Um, but San Michel, because of where it was on the Caprivi, on the line that it was, and I'll share some aerial shots from Google, there was a massive open shauna, like massive. So you would sit at the bar at San Michel and literally see whether it was elephants, whether it was villabeers, whether it was the hippo or two walking across. It was once that we actually had a hippo going through the boat because we were literally on the Kwando River um, from there. Crocodiles, I mean, big, ugly things. I remember the one uh, lieutenant's um, planing on a Sunday, including the one that I punched. By the way, we became good friends afterwards. Um, and as he was planing the boat, they hadn't attached on, and it was these, we had these Avon um, rubber duckies, grey Avons. And as he was planing, the motor fell off into the water. And uh, Colonel Burt was furious. And he said, you guys are not coming back until you find it. So back to the tiffies they went with old uh, Sergeant Dallas. And they made a steel rake so that they could drag it behind one of the Avons to try and feel where the motor was. And also to a bike a lot because it was like, and so we had to go and give them medical cover. And it was like, so now when you find it, how are you going to get it? Because this is croc-infested water. So they found it, or they think they found it, so they were dropping grenades. And, of course, all these fish were coming to the surface. And what do you think attracts dead fish? Crocodiles. So long story short, they never, ever recovered that motor. Um, but we, I, one of our biggest challenges was baboons. Those are horrible creatures, man, and they're scary. I'm more scared of a baboon than a terrorist, all right? Those things are horrible, and they're fast. They are very fast, big heads um, from there. So we had baboons. Um, it was like it really was like living in a game reserve um, from there. Um, one of the guys reported seeing a leopard. I, I didn't see the leopard. Um, snakes, I mean, snakes, gazillion um, from there. Various antelope uh, from there. I mean, it is a, it is really a beautiful part of the world. I'd love to go back there one day just because of the wildlife um, from there. Um, Dorpy's side being the other side of the Golden Highway towards Botswana, they would boast that they had equally as good wildlife um, from there. And you must remember where that apex is, where the previous trip narrows from Katima Malila. You know, you've got Botswana on the bottom, which is literally just above uh Moremi, um, you know, and you've got the Kwai River going down and Chobi. So animals don't know borders. They freely rotate. So what you would see in northern Botswana, Chobi Moremi on the Kwai River is what and Chobi River, you would see in the Caprivi at San Prashal, you would see um, at Dopis as well. Yeah, it's the Okubanga Delta because I grew up in Katima Mulilo. That's why I know that area is very good. But now I want to actually ask you serious questions, if you don't mind. Please. 
Well, I mean, it's something we call an OP. I'm not going to say the word in of recalls, but it, it, it's, it's punishment, PT. I think I, 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 well, all the forces had it, the police too. And you knew you were really deep in the cock, in the trouble, when the medics arrived there as well. Because then people are going to really run until they pass out or something. My question to you is as follows. As the medic around, how far does your powers go? Can you intervene to save life? Uh, can you override the commander? Is, is such a thing possible? Not that I was aware of, of course. You know, to me, the respect for rank overrid any of that um, from there. You know, um, I got into trouble um, because a Jehovah's Witness had a band on his arm that he wasn't allowed to have a blood transfusion. And I came to him, he was in a bad way and uh, needed a transfusion. And this was an immediate transfusion from troop to troop. We, we, yeah, he got it on his webbing belt, he's got his blood group. I'm not carrying every conceivable blood. And we did a transfusion and I ripped the band off, threw it in the bush. And then his family tried to go me afterwards because I saved his life. Um, so, but I got into trouble because I had crossed the line according to the military. I didn't respect that medic alert. But in the sense of, you know, as I told you, one of my tasks was keeping alive insurgents during interrogation. I had no authority to stop the interrogation. My job was to keep him alive at all costs. I could say, listen, you know, if you carry on anymore, I don't think I'm going to be able to revive him. But that didn't stop the intelligence officer from doing what they needed to do. And I'm unaware that any medical uh, ops medic had the authority to override an officer. I can't speak to the doctors. Uh, they, may, they may well have had authority to do that, but the ops medics definitely didn't. But to be fair, ops medics weren't at basic training. You know, we, we at the very least space ops medics, we were in the operational area, so... I didn't really deal with people getting uh, OP um, from there. I, I got my own OP for having attitude. Yeah, uh, that I got. I got a few ammo cases and things like that. Okay, so say to me, um, medically speaking, you said you could do minor surgery. Can you tell us about that? I, I'm trying to bring to the world how well trained to a yo yo. So, I mean, an example of this was the ops with uh, Billy Bumbo that um, we had a guy stand on an anti personnel mine, which took his foot to three quarters of the way through his shin. He was probably about six, seven inches away from his knee. Um, we were deep. Uh, into uh, Angola, there was no way for a Kazakh without giving away our position. So it was a case of stabilize him, leave him with uh, a pathfinder, let the rest of the uh, group move on so that the Kazakh could come in, get him, and then take him out. And they'd fly the Pumas from Ondangwa with these long range tanks. Um, and I met a guy here that actually was at Ondang's doing that. So it was interesting for him hearing the story from me, the other side, because he was uh, uh, an airman with the, with the Pumas. And this individual via radio back to Ondang were with a doctor. I was being guided to amputate his leg. All right. In the worst conditions, on a ground sheet, again, using keep law um, from there to keep him under. Uh, and keep him restrained. Uh, I did follow up uh, later to learn that he had to be re-amputated above the knee because of sepsis. But the job was stabilize, control, and move on. So as far as surgery goes, I don't think there's much more in trauma that you could do than cutting off the bottom end of somebody's limb or what's left of it. And that would give you an idea of the level of training that uh, seven med ops medics got beyond a normal ops medic um, from there. And a normal ops medic would be getting pretty far from that, uh, but I don't think they would have been put into the position of having to do an amputation. Is it easy to make a decision? 
Yeah, I'm pretty tight. Well, Chris, the guy's foot is pulverized. It's in pieces. His leg is in pieces on the bottom. There's nothing that can be repaired. Um, and actually trying to keep all that together, pressurize it for him to be collected and gone, he's probably going to bleed to death. If not, get sepsis or whatever. So, no, there's not really a, there's, you know, and this was part of the training. You weren't sitting there thinking, you know, minutes or life. This was just get on and do it. <clears throat> Getting the signal and saying, listen, get the doctor on. We're going to do this. Uh, I can't just tourniquet this up and stop the bleeding. Uh, we've got to get in there and actually, and the doctor talked me through it. And, you know, um, as I say, we were we were trained as machines. I didn't even think about it uh, to actually take. And, it, and it's literally done with a, a surgical saw with a handle of sawing through as straight and clean as you could, you know, cutting off whatever arteries, trying to have a little bit more length, thinking about the post-surgery that would need to be done um, from there. Uh, no, I, would, I wouldn't say that there's, there's, there's any hesitation. That I wouldn't say, and, you know, those are skills that have stood me well in life. Um, growing up in South Africa after that, on that N1 highway, I lost count of the accidents I stopped at and helped, which uh, most people you know, wouldn't know what to do. Uh, but I had to, in civilian life, remind myself, I'm not a civilian qualified paramedic. I'm a military qualified paramedic uh, from there. And there's also that decision that you sometimes in civilian life do need to stand back. But I tell you what, if it was you, me, my own family, and something happened, I would do what's necessary and deal with the consequences like the guy that I gave the blood transfusion to later. Because I'm going to save somebody's life. That's just what I'm going to do. Fascinating that you say that you want to save someone's life. Do you people consider yourselves to be soldiers or to be medics or to be both? Um, both. It's 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 definitely it's definitely both. Because even the tasks that I had, being a five O gunner, being a signaler, that wasn't exclusively being a medic. You know, that was you were part of the fabric of that unit. You know, and you did what, and the, the weapons training, the mortar training that we did with Captain Steph, that was with the Pathfinders, everybody else. It wasn't us providing medical cover. It's right, now you come and do it. Okay, last question here. Yeah. It might be a bit unfair, uh, but afterwards, especially uh, Dr. Walter Basson was abused by sight, most dreadfully by the South African media. He was found innocent of all charges. I want to say this up front. He was never found guilty of anything because he simply wasn't guilty of anything. It's that bloody simple. But seven <laughs> men, but seven men, sadly, the people started seeing you guys as a bunch of very secretive units with involved with chemical and biological warfare, blah, blah, blah. My question to you is this. Why was there a need for seven men to train troops into anti-chemical warfare. What was so, the threat against the troops for you guys to have to do that? That, that, that? That's that's a good question. And it came about, uh, there was intelligence that uh, the Cubans were using this against UNITA uh, from there, and that certain procedures and protocols would have to be established to protect ourselves. Because if the Cubans were happy to use it against UNITA, they would be more than happy to use it against South African territorial forces, against Kufut, against uh, SADF uh, from there. Um, the, the accusations to, uh, towards uh, ROC, um, you speak to any member, would not for a moment believe it. Why, to your question, would you need a unit going out training troops on how to protect themselves? Because there's intelligence that's being used. Because it went through chief staff intelligence to the medical corps that this was a medical thing. And from the medical corps said, well, the only guys that are really capable of this would be 7 Medical Battalion as a specialised medical unit to go out and train people um, from there. 
So, you know, I never thought there was anything sinister about it. Actually, when I left and I heard all the media and the whole lot, it was like, it's a stitch up, it's a setup. Somebody else is trying to cover somebody. So rather point fingers. And as you said, when asking the question, nobody's ever proven anything. He was acquitted of all charges to this day with all the witch hunting. They couldn't fabricate anything, all right? Um, I don't want to say more than I need to, but, uh, you know, these supposed labs that were being used to do other stuff as well, if you go to these facilities, really, and nobody knew about it, and there was nobody that could come forward and said, yeah, actually, I was the guy wheeling the barrels of you-know-what to make what. Absolutely true. I could not have said it better. And uh, I just want to say this is very interesting. Yeah, at the end, South Africa had fantastic medical services, fantastic media, uh, army equipment, Air Force equipment. You wouldn't believe. I wrote the book once and uh, I did some study and it had to do with fighter pilots and, uh, you know, the capabilities of, of a South African Air Force. And I had to find out something which is really amazing. Came out in the research, and you can check my research whenever it pleases you, because I'm right. But it is believed that it was Commodore Peter Gerard, the Soviet spy inside the South African Navy, who stole the Kukri helmet system. That's what they said. And that thing ended up in the Soviet Union. Then came the fall of the Berlin Wall. This happened. And guess what? East Germany then moved to West Germany and they had all the latest equipment of the East German Air Force. Major Warsaw block country. And of course they decided, oh, we're going to put these aircraft against each other. NATO and the Americans lost every single engagement against the ex-East German Air Force. And they lost every single engagement because of Kukri, the South African link, the South African system. Then they tested the Russians' air-to-air -air missiles. And they found out they were eight times, not percent, times better than anything which the Americans or NATO could have had. And I came to the conclusion, and this is shocking, NATO never had air superiority in the 80s. They never did. Then I wrote another book, codenamed Jen, it's one of the GMJ series, there's about 53 books there. And we had to find out that in South Vietnam, when it came to the end, when North Vietnam took it over, the North Vietnamese actually captured something like 48 brand new F-5E Tiger uh, fighters, which were frontline fighters. And they gave these things to the Russians, Soviets, who then created their own aggressor schools. Now, once again, there's a South African link, because if you say the name Dick Lord, you will find out that Dick Lord and mates actually wrote the Top Gun and Red Flag operational plans while he was still at the Royal Navy. This is where the enemy aircraft meet your own aircraft to work it out. I am going to record the John Boyd theory of fighter pilots in energy versus mass with some fighter jock in the future for you people to remember. And then it came out that from all those things, again, the Soviets had air superiority. And that shocked the hell out of me because they never told the Arab clients what envelopes to fly to defeat the Israeli aircraft. They never did that. They kept it to themselves. I recall Dick Lord once saying on the air to some chopper pilot who was misbehaving, something like, this is the Lord speaking. And uh, the guy actually, no, we, we said, tell his story. I think it did happen. But you know what? We're coming at the end, Mornay, but, you know, we, we were worms these days. We have a grey hair. Do you have any advice? If there's a youngster listening here, would you say to a man, go and have adventure in the army for a while 
and bingo and follow your dreams. Would, would you give advice like that? Oh, absolutely. If I, if I, if I could get into uh, a military service uh, of sorts, um, and, you know, militaries in countries today uh, provide a whole lot more than they ever did when we were there. Amongst others, I look at the South African, I'm not South African, the Australian Defence Force, the ADF. Um, you can go and study through the military. They'll pay your study while you serve part-time, learn skills, what have you. You can do this for one year, two year, three years, you know, um, as a voluntary construct um, and come out with life skills. Or, as I say, you were talking about people who can't afford study. You go and study through the military. They're going to pay for your studies. You provide service to them. They pay for your studies. You come out with a degree and you've grown up because there's, you know, I, I watched when I was at Harvard University, uh, we had... Uh, and I look for that. I'll find it and I'll see if I can send it to you because I recorded him, um, was one of the admirals who referenced another admiral who said, make your bed. If it starts with making your bed. If you can't make your bed, why are you trying to do anything else? It starts up okay, here, your attitude. How does your desk look? You know, if you're working in an untidy environment, that's how your brain's working, untidy. Um, you know, everybody now wants to work for six minutes and be the CEO and have a billion dollars. Yeah, it doesn't work like that, does it? Uh, so, you know, my, 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 probably my biggest advice to any youngster is um, find your passion. And they say, but how do I find my passion? And that I put to parents. The more you expose your children to things, the more that you invoke curiosity. Curiosity invokes passion. Um, at Harvard, I got the chance to uh, interview as part of our group. There was a guy called Jean-Claude Bouvet. Now, if anybody knows Jean-Claude Bouvet, he was the former CEO of Hublot Watches, all right? And he was and he was a guy accredited for turning them around from a game a bankrupt Swiss watch company, and they're octagonal in shape. Very expensive. They're like 20, 30,000 US dollars a watch um, from there. So knocking on Rolex's door. But at the time, they were almost bankrupt. And they said, you know, why were you so successful? Where? You know, what makes you so passionate about watches? He says, I'm not passionate about watches. We said, but you're successful. He says, I'm passionate about engines. When I was growing up, my dad had me in an engine. And all the watches... It's a little engine. That's my passion. And I translated it to watches, the precision, the mechanism. And that's, so for me talking to a youngster, find your passion by being curious. Don't dismiss everything. You see something. It might be how a McDonald's oven works. Go and have a look at that and go, do you know what? I'm sure there's a better way. Great. So now you're going to become an engineer. Um, and that was just an abstract example. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your time here. We, uh, when we talk too much, I forgot about time. This is fantastic. Thank you. But I really enjoyed right. this one, and I think we're going to call you back. And uh, let me say to the rest of you guys uh, watching, uh, the gentlemen, we're getting older, right? Between uh, Morna and myself, we're actually younger than most of you. So guys, please, come and talk to us. Don't, don't let your story go away. Don't don't think you are unimportant. Don't let those people say to you, man, you were just a troopy somewhere and uh, you had a slug roof or whatever they called you. Don't let that. Those days are past. You did your service. You didn't run away to London. You did what you could do to the best of your ability, I'm sure. And it helped you in your future life. Come and talk to us. Don't, don't, don't let it die with you. So as we say here at Legacy, until we meet again, God bless. Thank you, Chris.